Hi there and welcome to my home. So today we're going to talk about rendering. Uh, in particular, this isn't an exhaustive example of rendering. This is actually just a quick and dirty version of rendering with a couple of tips for you if you're doing some renderings for your final project in scenic design. Rendering has lots of different facets based in all sorts of areas of art, but there's also in some ways no rules. You can make it out of any medium you want in any way that you want as long as it communicates what you're trying to communicate and the five things you need to remember to communicate any time with a rendering is mood color scale space and movement so what do i mean by that i mean mood just a general atmosphere of your show and what it looks like you're trying to communicate with the director the general idea of your design so if it doesn't have mood or atmosphere then you're falling flat a little bit the whole point is to give a more um uh, dynamic picture than an architectural drawing would. Color is something that can be meticulously and carefully placed or general impression of color, but it should give an idea of what kinds of colors are in this show. And there may be some give and take. You may have a psych in the background that you choose to color blue so that it makes the rest of your set stand out, but Overall, you should have some accurate representation of color in there to help them understand. There may be artistic license taken with that, but at least some color is communicated. And then scale. And by that, I don't mean it has to be entirely in scale. That's what your drafting is for. Instead, you need at least a person in there, something to give a general idea of the relation of your set to the space and what a person would look like in that space. The next one is then space. So there should be some sort of accurate understanding of where the wings are, of where the audience is, of where furniture pieces are, of where scenery moves, and what relation of spaces uh, between each object. So perspective is important and uh, general size comparison is important as well. Movement is sometimes a little difficult to show in a single rendering and can sometimes come in the form of thumbnails, but it should show how the set changes from scene to scene or throughout the process. All right, so let's get started with some basics. All right, so once you have your sketch, like I do right here for Big River, you're gonna take this and put it on something that you can paint because rendering really only has two steps. You draw a drawing and then you paint it. But of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So first of all, you're gonna take your sketch and I have a light pad underneath right here and you can see that I can turn that light on and see through it, which means I can use a sheet of watercolor paper and I can take this sheet of watercolor paper and I can set it on top of my rendering of my sketch and on the light box and I can see right through it. So it's not super clear, but it is clear enough that I can see through underneath it and transfer that sketch. Because once I have one sketch, I really don't need to draw it again. <laughs> not if I can help it. This is my drawing and I have made this by my own hand and it is not cheating for me to reuse this drawing in any way. Another thing I tend to do is to scan this and copy and paste it and then print it. When you print it, however, inkjet printers have water soluble ink. So they're gonna move around as soon as you start painting on top of it. A copier, however, has uh, a laser that etches that ink into the paper. And because it's heat set, it generally doesn't move nearly as much with water. So I will often scan these or set them to be copied onto watercolor paper directly through a copier. Now, you probably don't have that at home, so the tracing option is always there. And if you don't have a light tablet or a, a light box, you can always use a window. As long as the sun is out, you can tape that up and transfer all your big lines. The other thing is that when you transfer, you probably wanna transfer with something that's a little bit sturdier than our, our regular uh, pencil. Pencil is a good way to start and you can transfer all your pencil lines first if you want to because you're nervous. But another thing you can do is use pen. Now, I, I find a lot of people start with transferring with Sharpie. So they think Sharpie is going to be a great idea. Uh, but actually, one of the things you might not realize is that once you get that wet, sometimes it can have quite a bit of bleed. And you can see right there that the color of my paper changed 
and certainly as I move it across, it gets both a red and a blue tint to it, which is not ideal. Um, the, the Sharpie bleeds quite a bit, but some other, especially ballpoint or commercial pens, I actually find this pen is great, but these pens tend to leave a very nice black line and not be water soluble. So some of these pens in particular are not particularly water soluble and they don't move very much when you paint on top of them. Now I'm painting on top of regular printer paper instead of um, watercolor paper. You might need a closer look there actually. But this one has a lot of this blue ink coming right off of it. And these ones have a little bit less. Uh, it does have a little bit of ink and it's not ideal. Generally what I use ideally is particularly made color fast ink such as India ink or uh, calligraphy ink. This one I've mixed water in so it says gray. Um, but I'll use that to trace this with a dip pen to make it really uh, easy. But any pen that you try and do this with, you want to do a test on your the actual paper you're going to use to make sure it's not going to bleed too much. All right. Next, I'm going to transfer this onto watercolor paper. So this particular light tablet isn't very expensive, but you can adjust the brightness of it, which is pretty useful. And then in order to trace this, one of the things that you want to do is you want to trace it onto um, uh, something with a little bit more thickness. So I have watercolor paper here. And technically you can use a couple different types of paper. You can use watercolor paper, you can use Bristol board, you can use a couple different things. I am gonna go ahead and see if I can fit this sideways actually. So I'm gonna tape these two pieces of paper together. And the reason I'm going to do that is so that they stay very flat and it is easier to trace when they stay flat together, but also just so that it doesn't shift as the design moves, because I'll want to move this around to have the best access to these lines that I can. I'm going to use uh, black India ink that I was talking about. And, so I'm here. And I'm going to there we go. And I am going to keep the pen mostly closed. So in order to draw this, it's generally a good idea to start at the top because that will allow you to not stick your hand in the thing that you're drawing. With a dip pen, the harder you push, the thicker that line is going to be, but also the quicker you're going to run out of ink. So I'm going to use that just to emphasize for the moment and then keep going. So I'm going to trace this with this pen. But again, you can use a couple different kinds of pens and inks, but it all depends on how much, it, it all depends on what you have and how much you're willing to let it bleed. This isn't gonna bleed at all, which I like. So I'm just gonna trace this, and we'll come back when I'm a little bit farther along. Now I'm I'm gonna add I'm gonna add a gem on the edge of this wrap. So I think that I think it's important 
to show that this this right here is a child and there's an adult so the advantage of this is also you can just go ahead and and draw right on top so if there's you know an adult man you want to put over down here I'm gonna just I'm gonna draw in the overall shape with a pencil and then I'm gonna look at I I also have some things down here that I I forgot to draw in that are well it stopped recording but thanks to movie ma magic here we go so I just uh, continued to uh, trace it all the way around and I traced my little guy over here and then I waited and now I waited until my ink is really nice and dry and uh, where we left off I was drawing these pencil uh, sketch pieces in here and I can go ahead and erase those now and you can see that once my ink is all dry I have a nice even surface and I can erase all that pencil so if you didn't have a light box, you could easily just do the same thing. You could draw the whole thing in pencil and then you could cut and you could ink it and then you could come back and erase your pencil. You want to do this before you start to paint because you won't be able to erase the pencil after. And the other thing is you want to make sure and double check before you move on that you've gotten everything you want to get. So you've added all the extra people you want to add if you want to add some extra people and you've changed anything you want to change and you've made all the adjustments you want to make and one of the things I did here was I went back and I made some of these corners and edges darker right on the edges of the platform and that allows uh, a little bit of line weight to help tell the story of this image before I finish so I'm going to I went ahead and printed out a couple of mm -hmm. smaller versions mm -hmm. of this here we go, fell on the floor. Uh, a couple smaller versions of this set from the SketchUp model that I based the sketch on. And I'm gonna do another trace down here. But this time I'm just gonna do it with a ballpoint pen. Show you the difference there. So I'm gonna just grab a tr trusty FIU pen and I'm gonna draw this piece down here. So it's a little bit harder to see underneath this table because it's a colored image, which is why the sketch itself was a lot easier to trace. And one of the things you want to be aware of and be really careful of is that this is the step, either on the small one or this big one, where you're really going to be tempted to cut some corners. Now, I am literally gonna draw this one a lot more gesturally than I drew this one. This would be like a really nice finished rendering and this would be some thumbnails. So the thumbnails are generally a little bit more of an impression. And in addition to that, I'm gonna change the set, the setup, right? So I'm gonna imply the scenery, but I'm gonna move the raft. So I'm going to put the raft kind of under the center platform where it lives for most of the show before it gets pulled out. And I'm going to just take some, my time placing things. I think they're going to go. And then there's at some point a, a, a dinner table scene. So I'm going to grab my pencil so that I can set that up, draw that right on top. My people are going to be a lot more gestural down here. And there's also at the top of the show, there's a, a Mark Twain. It's telling a story over here. So I'm going to add in all those little pieces. And uh, what I was going to say before is this is really a point where a lot of people are tempted to skip. They're tempted to rush this through. But you really want to be a little bit more careful and methodical here. 
because this is the, going to be the foundation drawing for the rest of your entire uh, painting. And you do want to be a little bit more careful and deliberate with this. This is the most permanent step that you're taking. That being said, since you're tracing an original drawing or a drawing that you did and you still have that drawing underneath, that means that you'll be able to come back to it pretty much any time you want. Now, I know I'm doing this very quickly, but that's also because this is a thumbnail, not the actual uh, rendering. So this might be something I do even without the original underneath. I could give it just a little bit more interest and texture. I'm also going to look over here because I don't remember where my light bulbs are and that's going to make it a little bit easier. Also being less exact about where my, my horizontal lines are, it's just an impression of what's going on more than an exact replica. I'm going to do the same thing I did before though and I'm going to go back in and where the platforms are I'm going to take a second to make those a little darker, a little stiffer. I'm going to try to make this chair a little more pronounced. Again, I'm less worried about exactly where all those lines are and a little bit more concerned that I have the impression correct. Okay. Okay. And all right, so we'll do that little thumbnail. So sometimes, again, if I've done my sketch and I have photocopied it, and not spent this physical time. I can take a little bit of time now and, oh, I forgot these little guys. Again, I forgot those little guys, so I'm gonna put them back in. Uh, I can just take this to the photocopier and go ahead and copy it, and I won't have to redraw this a second time, a third time. And I really like to do that because it lowers my time and labor. It makes it a little bit easier to complete these things and also have little ones to play with. So now I'm gonna switch out my board underneath. Okay, so I changed out some of my stuff. And what I wanna do is go ahead and untape this piece on the back. Now, I didn't tape the piece on the back of that little one because I knew it was gonna be a quick and easy piece to trace and I wasn't gonna have to move it around very much. But I also wasn't able to move it around on the light pad the way I was with this one on top. So one of the things you wanna remember is that your tape can and will pull up quite a bit of your um, paper edge and, and really destroy the, the edge of the watercolor paper. So I wanna keep that sketch just in case I wanna do a different rendering or another rendering later. And I'm gonna come in and I am going to cut this. And what I want to do is cut it at a nice even size. And I'm going to use my model making skills to measure and then cut. And I have this handy little mat. So this is my bigger rendering piece. And I'm also going to cut out my little one. I'm going to go ahead and put more air around this one. Be a little, I can be a little less precise with this one because I can make a lot of extra room around it. And then if I want to. Uh, cut that out again later, I can. But I can make it a little bit more freehand. So these are both on watercolor paper and you can use many different kinds of paper, like I said, Bristol or anything else. But watercolor paper is gonna be one of the ones that's the most forgiving. 
Watercolor paper does have a smoother side and a more textural side. And I put this on the more textural side because I do like the way that tends to look. I am gonna go ahead and put my little one up here and my big one down here. And I'm gonna grab my tape. And now I'm going to tape this down again. But this time I'm gonna stick it somewhere first. You can stick it on surface and pull it up. You can stick it on your pants and pull it up, whatever you wanna do. But this means that when I stick it on the edge of this piece, it's not gonna pull up quite as much of the watercolor paper. When I stick it down, I'm gonna be real careful. I'm gonna get real careful up against that edge and make sure it's about a quarter of an inch from the edge. And I want, it doesn't actually matter what size that is, I just want it to be consistent all the way around. So I'm gonna tape that down. I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna get off the tape, get some of the adhesive off of it, and then place it down nice and even. And what this is gonna do is that it's gonna get a nice even frame all the way around because you really can't avoid painting this around. Uh, one of the reasons we make them all black is because our generally has a black around or black legs, and that really helps us to envision. Oops. That's almost fresh and it should come out a little easier. Um, but it helps us to envision what that's really gonna look like. So because of that, we want to go ahead and paint this around this black one as well. And by giving this, I'm gonna give this a little bit thicker of a border. That's about a half inch, three eighths to a half inch. And it doesn't have to be exact. This is not uh, a science in the sense that your borders have to be exactly the same on every piece, but you wanna make them the same all the way around your item so that when you take their tape off, if you got water, you're able to fill a background in with the watercolor or the acrylic and give yourself something that looks nice on the outside. Okay, so once I get that all taped down, I actually want to do something first, and that is I'm gonna take the largest brush that I have, oops, and I'm gonna set up. I'm gonna set up my water. I'm gonna set up my brushes, and I'm gonna get out my paint. Now, what I'm gonna start with is I'm gonna take one of my larger brushes. Now what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with a larger brush and I'm going to put it in water and I'm actually just going to bathe the whole thing in water. And you can see right here that pen's holding up pretty well, it's not bleeding too much and I'm going to do the same over here. And what this does is it really primes the watercolor paper to receive a nice even wash of color. It does not make it great for detail. You want it to be fully dried if you want to get crisp detail. But by wetting it, it's gonna make it a little bit easier to do what you want to do. It'll also cause it to bubble up, but since we taped it down, it will settle down. So uh, while I wait for that to dry a little bit, I'm gonna to talk to you about, really, there's just two steps to rendering. You draw it and then you paint it. <laughs> When you draw it, as you saw, there were a couple different techniques to drawing it. You can trace it. You could also transfer this with graphite paper and then trace it with black ink. You could do a lot of other things. You could just paint this with pencil. You don't have to have the black ink, but the black outlines really help you to be able to see it. You could also, if stylistically you want brown instead of black or blue instead of black, that's also fair game. There's not a whole lot of hard and fast rules here. Now. The reason we taped it down is because anytime we soak a piece of paper, it's gonna wrinkle. And if we tape it down, when it dries, it will flatten right back out. So that's important. It's important that the thing that you tape it to is something with a little bit of absorption. Don't tape it to a piece of plastic or the, the water that seeps through the paper is gonna sit on the bottom and reabsorb in a way that's not super attractive. So a little bit of absorbency in your board is good, which is why it's artist board, board. Um, these are bo all, both pillowing up right now boop, boop, boop. and so they've got a little bit of air in them. They've expanded so I need for, to wait for them to calm back down before I can uh, paint them a little bit more. And uh, for the paint, I'm going to use watercolor in this demonstration because one, that's what I have in a really accessible reactivatable palette. Two, it's going to give me some layers really nice. But three, you can really use whatever you want. Uh, you can use a mixture of acrylic, gouache, or watercolor. It does not matter. 
Uh, this will allow me to reactivate. Gouache also reactivates. Acrylic does not reactivate, but you can water it down and it'll function almost exactly like this. It will not reactivate, so if you, uh, you can actually choose to do it in many different ways. Um, but sometimes I'll do color and atmosphere in this medium and then add shadows in the same medium or I'll do a permanent medium and this coloring medium. So if I'm gonna use two things, if I'm gonna use the color and the, sh uh, if I'm gonna use a transient medium, something that reactivates, and a permanent medium, something that doesn't reactivate, I use the permanent thing first. So in this case, I used permanent ink, it's permanent, it's down. Now I could also do use acrylic or ink and do uh, shadows in all of this and have that dry and then do color on top. But if you're doing it all in water watercolor, generally what you want to do is do big color to little color. So after you do this prep, you want to do atmosphere, general color, detail, and then the surround. So that's what we're going to do and in the order we're going to do it. Uh, I'm going to grab a little something to make this go a little faster. So patience is a virtue. And it's important that you have patience and make sure things are completely dry before you move on to the next stage. Sometimes, however, I'm not so incredibly patient, which is why I use a hairdryer. So I can use this to speed along the drying process. So we're gonna do that right now. Okay, so they're mostly dry and that is I know I just said be patient, make it sure it's incredible, it's all the way dry. But I actually want to do an overall wash first, so it isn't actually important that it's completely dry for this first set, first time. This one is flatter than this one, so I'm going to start over here. Uh, this is one of my favorite brushes to use when I'm rendering, but it is absolutely not required. Um, it, I like, I like it. I think it works great. It allows me to get big swaths of area. It's like using a big brush and a little brush at the same time. Uh, it's not very stiff though. So for example, over here, I really need to grab some water and reactivate some colors in order to get this to work. And I know that all of this is very blue and very green. And so I wanna pick a color for the atmosphere um, to lay down that is not going to fight with that. So I want to color my psych with something. So I'm actually going to use a yellow and an orange. So I'm going to come into my watercolor pa palette and activate a large amount of orange just right here in this pan so that I can grab it with the other brush. And I can, I can use this one as well. Uh, so I'm just going to lay that down. And we've used acrylic a couple times, but with watercolor, you wanna make sure that that edge is nice and watery. I also, I'm gonna leave these gentlemen mostly undisturbed and the top of the platform's mostly undisturbed. I'm just gonna get a general atmosphere of orange in here. And before it dries, I realized that I forgot about a thing. So I forgot that each one of these is a light. So it's gonna glow. So I'm gonna come in with a dry brush, pull that light off. I'm gonna lighten that color around each one of these lights. And that is where the part of this being a um, transient medium is really advantageous, right? I can just scrub it up a little bit. I'm gonna grab a little bit more orange and I'm gonna come in kind of down the bottom of the psych. And we blend that up gently. I'm 
you get a little bit of this orange on the curtains. These curtains are eventually going to be black, so you won't really see them, but it'll give it a little bit of warmth to the black, and that'll be useful. All right, when you're working with a rendering with something like this, it's not rocket science. It's not exactly the way uh, that the scenery is going to happen. It's an idea and uh, kind of an emotional representation. So because of that, I am going to embrace a lot of the uh, more decorative pieces. So I'm not going to try and blend this out. I'm not going to try and fix this right here. I'm going to try and leave some of that where it is. I'm going to take some brown and bring it in as kind of a ground and a shadow underneath these platforms to help see some depth before I add a little more, more blue. And I don't know if you noticed, but I'm artificially leaving the people alone. I want them to feel a little bit like they're in a spotlight in the show. And so if the concentration of this light is right there, it's going to be lighter over here and even darker over here. So let's add some more brown over here just to darken this area. Because this is uh, watercolor, it every time it dries, it dries a lot more transparent. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dry this real quick. So I'm not going to worry too much about the what looks like paint strokes here. I could, if I was getting very fussy, come back in and blend them out while they're still a little bit moist, and they'll blend out really nice. When they're fresh, they blend out even after they've recently dried. If I leave them for a little while longer, it will be harder to blend them out, but not, not really that hard. Um, I'm not really worried about them though. And I think that those brush strokes give this character. This is not hiding that it's a painting. Okay. So now that that is mostly dry, we're going to add in color. So I'm going to add in the color that I think all these items are. And I'm going to try and do that without losing the atmosphere that I've already created. So in order to do that, I need to one, pay attention to it. And two, just be careful with the application of color. So I can, I usually like to do this with a round brush. Actually, this one's gonna be better. I usually like to do that with a round brush of about this size here. So I'm gonna come in, this is a, this is a five. So I usually I like to do a three or a five. And I'm gonna, I'm going to use blues. I'm going to use some of these blues. And I'm going to mix some of them together because I want them to be very gray and brown. And I have black to mix in with that, right? And it makes a very greenish color. So maybe I want to add a little bit of green. I'm going to mix these colors and then and activate the ones I want to use before I kind of go to town. And I did dry this, and the reason I did that is so that I can better precisely apply the blue where I want it to be. And I'm not worried about this blue being a little saturate because it, I am painting it over orange. And because orange and blue are complements, the orange is going to tone this down a little bit. The brown is going to tone it down as well. Anywhere where I think it's still going to be light, I'm not going to color it all the way over. Now, what do I think they're wearing? I can look at my costume designer's renderings. 
and mimic that. I can do a lot of different things actually. But I'm just going to give them kind of a very brown, bleak looking set of globes. One of the big mistakes that you can make is painting something all one color all the way across. Every time you're painting something, it has dynamic range in it. And so one of the things the acrylic does when you water it down like watercolor or using watercolor itself is that it allows you to get these light washy glazes and place them very intentionally in some places rather than others. Now, this is a very small surface area to be playing with over here. And I'm trying to stop short of this little light bulb over here so that I'm, not, I'm leaving that light. And paying close attention to where you're placing things and how you're uh, putting shadows because eventually you will make be reinforcing those shadows is a good idea. But essentially, once you place color, you can do a couple more layers to place color wherever you want it to be. Or like in this case, I still need to place the color in their clothes. And then you can just do subsequent layers for detail. So whatever detail you add on top of them, you can continue to add. in order to make it pop out. When I'm placing my color, I'm not necessarily just coloring the whole thing. So I'm coming in and coloring, I'm using the shadow to help me place color. So where I think the light is not hitting is part of where I start to place this color. And then that'll help me moving forward. Before we move on to the next part, I'm going to double check that, yeah, it looks like I've colored at least a little bit of everything. So now I'm going to come in with that smaller round brush and do some more details.
one of the things shadow does do in adding details is give you a sense of depth. So I want to push the places that matter less back and away by making them darker. And I want to bring the things that are more important up into the foreground. So to do that, I'm going to not touch them. So I'm trying to touch all the spots that I want to push back. And that can be a little difficult with things like these palettes that have a lot of detail to them and they're very interesting. But I really want to push them into the background. And not make them too much of the focus. I'm also not worried about it being absolutely exact. I have gotten out of the lines a couple times, but as long as it feels pretty contained and not willy-nilly, it doesn't matter. There's a difference between looking perfect and looking fussy. And so I don't want to be particularly fussy. But if I do a couple different colors on these logs, they start to look more dynamic. And each time I do a different color, each time I do another shadow, I make sure not to completely overlap the shadow beforehand. Otherwise, I won't be able to see the difference between what I've done and what I did before. I'm always thinking about the shape of this object and how it relates to light. So I'm going to give it the shadow on the other underside of the log as it rolls over. Yeah. This one's a little too bright. So I'm going to come back in and put some shadow on our people, really kind of pop them out, just like when we're looking at real scenery and stage design. It's all about the people and the storytelling of those people. So by taking a little time to intricately shade your people, even if they're pretty gestural, gives you a lot more uh, interest to the picture. It makes it feel like it's more about more about them. Okay, that's probably about as much detail as I want to do. I'm going to grab some bright yellow, and I'm going to come in, and I'm just going to get a little of that going on. And I'm going to use the watercolor to just scrub a little bit and that'll help get that feeling of lightness and actually pull some of the color or, that I put down out of the surrounding materials on purpose. Okay, so let's dry this. And now we're actually going to do something that's probably going to make your heart skip a beat. And that is I'm going to take the black ink and I'm going to take a brush and I'm going to dip black my paintbrush into my black paint and I'm going to paint the surround. So I'm just going to come in with a nice rich black paint for the edge edge of the stage. And I'm going to paint that in. And you can see now this is why we had the tape at a very specific border. And I'm going to go ahead and come in to this piece right here. I'm going to add a little bit of water to the ink because this is very much like watercolor. 
I also don't want to get rid of this little guy over here, so I want a little bit of transparency. This that I'm painting with right now is permanent. It is not watercolor. It is not going to come up. It's not going to scrub. It is not going to get gray. It's going to be black. Well, this one does have a little bit of water in it, but it's going to be black. So I'm going to come in with this black here, trim it in. And this is why we put the tape down so that we get a nice clean edge when we pull this up. You can see now that it's going to look really fancy once we pull it up and really clean. I hope you can also see that right now that made a huge difference with the finished look of this rendering. Like it changed pretty dramatically into something that looks a lot more like a stage show but also translates a lot cleaner just with a quick black surround. This is also something that even if you do your rendering in acrylic, or uh, watercolor, sorry, I recommend doing this part in acrylic. It is just not very advantageous to do this surround in black watercolor. It's just not worth it. Okay. Now because that's ink, once it dries, it is going to be completely completely set. So let's go ahead and dry that. Okay. So that's dry. Now I actually do have black watercolor right here and I'm going to bring this in in the next set of legs. So this next set of legs, now I'm painting not with black ink, but with black watercolor. And this is the scary part because I'm not just going to come in and stop there. I'm not just going to come in where the black is. I'm actually going to come in a little further. And what I want to do is I want to bring the volume down, if you will, on the rest of the scene so that I can make it feel like the spotlight is on our performers and I can make these guys up here feel like they're glowing. And if you're thinking to yourself, that means destroying a lot of what I just did, you are kind of right. Okay, this is not precious, it's just a rendering, but it is something that's going to be a little difficult for you to do. It's going to be a little scary. If you overwork it, you're going to pick up the blue in a way you don't like. If you don't work it enough, it won't feel like they're glowing, right? And that did significantly change the look of the details of the items that I do have in here. But I'm also going to use this watercolor to bridge the gap between the ink and the surface. And that way, I get a really clean transition. Okay. So the, the last thing I'm going to add is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put a bit of a sharp line right at the edge of each of these black curtains because it would theoretically be darkest right before the edge. So I come in with that dark line and then come in with a little water. And that's going to help water that, water that out nicely. And that is part of the beauty of watercolor.
and that helps it feel a little bit more like it has depth. And that's it. That's a rendering, start to finish. Uh, if you want to use a rendering, you only need to show movement, which can be a little difficult, but sometimes you can also show a different part of your show by using thumbnails. And these are almost exactly the same, but they often just don't have the room for a lot of detail. So it's the same steps, atmosphere, and then dry. The color of the set itself. But here I can be a lot less precise because the set itself is so tiny. So I'm just getting an impression of where that color is. The same way that I did with the sketch. I just got a quick impression in there of what that color was. I didn't worry about matching each and every piece of it exactly. So I've basically done the same thing here. I'm going to use some brown on the people, mostly because there's a table involved here, and a chair and a stool, and then our individual. And now I'm going to take a little bit of shadow color, and I'm just going to add a little detail in there. So if I want one thing to stand out over another, I'm going to try and make sure that detail gets added. I also want the way I did before to kind of ground the bottom out, push some things into the background. And I'm also, in this shell, there's also some Spanish moss that comes down. So I'm going to try and get like a grayish color, a grayish green. I'm going to try and add a little bit of that in. pretty much just looks fuzzy in there, but that's the game. And now I'm going to add the black surround and finish it up. So this time I'm going to do it with the, get the ink off my brush. I'm going to go ahead and do it with watercolor and show you why the ink is better. So if I go ahead and do this with watercolor, Watercolor can be a lot firmer if you're careful, right? It can be a lot thicker if you make it thicker, if you do a couple layers, but generally it is very thin and takes a lot of effort to get thicker. So I'm going to have to let that dry a few more times before I can do another layer. But I'm going to go ahead and do my internal layers with it. Oh, I definitely, I just put him in the dark. So he is no longer the focus. It's these people over here. Easy peasy. And a little silhouette action going on. And that's where we're going to put our focus. Now, I'm going to let that dry. So my video stopped recording again. But... What I did was I let this guy dry and then I did another coat of black right on top. And you can see over here that I've done another coat of black and it looks spontaneously darker. And that's because if you have watercolor, you can mix it very thickly and you can get a thick amount and you can place it with a certain amount of opacity, but you're gonna need to do several coats. It's gonna take a long time and it's just not worth the time, the energy to do that when you have a lot darker things in your arsenal. Speaking of which, if this little bit looks brighter and these little lights look slightly brighter, congratulations, you noticed the fact that I also put white on there. So I just grabbed some acrylic white and took a paintbrush and dabbed it on a couple spots I wanted to highlight. Although watercolor purists would say that no, you absolutely have to paint all your darks in and leave your lights, and you can try and do that, but this is not a watercolor masterpiece. It's a rendering for you to communicate with somebody else about what something looks like. Because of that, I went in 
went in and dabbed each one of these little bright light bulbs with a tiny dot of white for the actual light bulb itself. And that is going to give it just a little bit more pizzazz. I put a tiny bit of highlight on these people and these people just to make them more star of the show. And that about finishes it up. I can always continue to come back in right on top and add some shadows to give this side just a little bit of pop, push things down in a way to make things darker in some areas. And every time you increase that contrast that a little bit, it will tend to look a little bit better. I can also erase some of this brightness with a very light wash and help focus where I want it to focus. And other than that, I want to be careful that I don't lose some of my detail because with a little bit of that larger wash, I lost a little bit of the detail down here. So I can spend some time popping that back out. But every time I do, I want to wait for this to dry because each layer I put on is going to be, is going to bear more fruit for my efforts. So what I mean by that is that if you only have, if you try and do everything in watercolor in one layer, it really just ends up looking muddy. If you wait till it dries and layer it on top, it looks nicer. And that is why the hair dryer is your friend. So uh, this is your quick and dirty rendering, uh, a big rendering and a little rendering. Uh, if you're only doing a rendering, uh, this is a really good uh, size or a whole sheet of paper. You want to go bigger with your physical rendering. Just as an FYI, if you go bigger, it looks better. It, if you, even if you scan and enlarge your sketch, if it takes up a whole sheet of paper and then you scan it and send it somewhat to someone, they're looking at it on a smaller screen than what you made. And it, make, it makes it look like you could draw a lot smaller than you really could. It allows you to achieve more detail with less effort. Do be careful, like over here, that you don't allow your uh, watercolor to bleed somewhere you don't want it to go before it's dry. And that can happen when you hit it with a hairdryer. Um, but uh, once you're done and it's all dry, this bottom one is dry, you can go ahead and carefully remove it and take your tape off and try and take your tape off as close to it as you possibly can by pulling tight and away and that will make it a little bit easier for you not to rip the paper. And then you'll get this nice, perfectly smooth edge. This was a little bit ripped already beforehand from the last time we taped it. And you can fix that. I like to just roll the pilling off. But that gives you a really nice looking rendering. And then you can label it. thinking I spelled lyric wrong, but I didn't. I spelled my own name wrong. All right. So there is a nice image that you can do, the same as your little one. And these little thumbnails are great, are a great thing to make multiple of in different scenes to show different units moving to different locations. If for some reason, you feel like this is too muddy, which I do right now. Again, don't be afraid to come back in with another medium. So I'm gonna come back in with my pen again and just come back in and freshen up some of those lines. This is about communication. So you want it to communicate the setting and the set that you want to see. And because of that, if it doesn't, you should keep, you should keep working on it. 
again, if for some reason I thought this was just a lost cause, I could always uh, go back and start again. It wasn't that. It wasn't that difficult. And I am going to go in, even after I pulled it off, as long as I don't get everything all soaking wet, I'll be okay. But I just need to put some ground under this stuff, I think. I think that's what I'm really missing. I'm going to water that edge out so it gets soft. And I think that'll help make it feel, I think that helps make it feel like it's sitting on the ground instead of floating in the air. So now I'm done. For real I swear and again I usually do this with uh, watercolor or gouache but you can absolutely do with it, do it with acrylic and one of the most common things I do is I will do my that first overall wash of color with acrylic because then it won't come up as I do all my other watercolor layers on top inversely I could also add shadows meticulously of everything involved in ink or acrylic let that dry and then all of the atmosphere I put on top will not pull up or get my shadows muddy. So you can use the advantage of both of these materials and mediums to give you something that works better. Uh, and that is your quick and dirty rendering tutorial.